Hi, I'm Heidi Hutner, and we're here today with Ben Mirren, a beatboxer. I'm not quite sure what that means, but we're going to find out. And he's a sound genius with animal sounds taken from all over the world, which is partly what really interests me as a researcher at Stony Brook University, where we have lots of people doing ecology and work on animals. So Ben, we're just so excited to have you here today. What is beatboxing? Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Heidi. Uh, beatboxing is both a language and a music style to me. Um, I've been beatboxing since I was about eight or nine years old. It's music made entirely with your mouth, and on a most basic level, it sounds like this. And you can add more sounds on top of percussion, like and make it uh, more bassy, like or you can add higher effects, like and those are just funny sounds that I've made for most of my life. Okay. Um, and I didn't even know what beatboxing was, culturally speaking, until I entered really high, high school and then college uh, and had people say, you're a beatboxer. And I said, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> um, it's music made the ways I've, in the ways I've just showed you, but um, because it uses an instrument that we all have, um, it's also very much a reflection of a person's linguistic and cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. As a mimic, kind of walking around with this instrument all the time, you have any number of sources of inspiration at your disposal at all times. Mm -hmm. So you can draw together all different kinds of musical influences from a place. And what fascinates me about beatboxers is not so much how they're pushing the envelope, although that is always fascinating to me, but the story that they tell about themselves based on how they assemble their sounds and their musical ideas. So mu music to me is expressed primarily through beatboxing. I've also played guitar and been a singer and like all different kinds of music um, mm -hmm. and, and have studied a lot of different things throughout my life, but beatboxing has been the most consistent type of music that I've done. Okay, so you use animal sounds. I do. How do you do that? I travel now the world. Um, and uh, when I can't go myself, I work with colleagues on the ground to record wildlife in endangered ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And listening to that, it's already like you're listening to music because mm -hmm. these are really complex biophonies and geophonies, and some, sometimes they're influenced by human sounds as well. But they are essentially natural orchestras of sounds that have evolved to tell a story of a relationship between a voice and a landscape. And because of the way sound moves, that landscape literally shapes how the sounds take shape in, in themselves and how they are received among different species and within the same species. So if you listen to a dawn chorus, for example, all these different birds that are waking up and singing have their own frequencies. And sometimes they sing notes that carry across to other species, but usually they're talking to just their friends in the same category. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing to me to examine that story. Like I mentioned about beatboxing, I think that a lot of the things that we can pull out of sound are essentially the, the building blocks for a story, in this case of natural history. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the task is to combine the natural history and the personal narrative mm -hmm. and then see what we end up with. And it, so far in my work, it's been a combination of human and, and avian vocal acrobatics that tell a story of how we creatively relate with nature as artists, as scientists, and just as human beings. So mostly birds? Mostly birds for now, but I have just started to expand into a lot of other animal groups, and I gotta say, birds are my gateway, because I've been a birder since I was three, but now I'm in love with the sounds of whales and orangutans and lions in the Serengeti, and, and what's really exciting about all these things, and all, all these animals, all these places, is that they constantly transform your idea of what's possible mm. acoustically, mm -hmm. vocally, mm -hmm. and it just is a constant reminder that ours is not the only way of making music, let alone the only way of communicating. And when you think about the sounds that I'm recording to then put on gear like we have here in front of us, right. I don't change anything about that, and that's mainly because it's language. Mm -hmm. What sounds like music to us is really language to them mm -hmm. that is essential for survival, and so I want to pay tribute to that wow. and create a combination of two, diff two different voices, my own and theirs, mm -hmm. um, that's more of an anthem to the place's natural heritage than it is about just combining things for the sake of combining them. It really represents a relationship, I think. That's a really beautiful way of putting an anthem to the natural heritage. Thanks. I'd, that's gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you just made that up on the spot, but it's really beautiful. So I have so many questions to ask you while of course, you're talking. Yeah. A million thoughts yeah. running through my head. One is you must be influenced by Bernie Krause, who is you know the king of bioacoustics, at least in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I really love his work, and it's just so beautiful. And the other piece is 
Uh, do you have any kind of thing you want to say about the fact that many of these places are vanishing and these sounds are vanishing? Sure. Well, I want to f answer your first question. Shout out to Bernie Krause. He's, uh -huh. he's great. Um, I was in the early stages of formulating what I was trying to do uh, as a sound artist, as a musician, and I was working as a science journalist by day and then taking sounds from the stories, from the animals that I wrote about in my stories because sound is a huge world to dive into and right. I needed a way of cutting the cake. So uh -huh. I, used, I used the news to focus my attention. And I started to pick up these, these bits and pieces that formed a puzzle mm -hmm. and um, immediately I was confronted by this artistic concern that I did not anticipate of deciding whether to preserve the orchestra or in creating a piece of music to accentuate for, for a human comparison, to accentuate the violin or the cello or one particular instrument. And, mm. and that's a question you face also when you're recording natural soundscapes is do you want to have a parabolic dish that isolates one sound over the others or do you want to capture the whole soundscape at once? And Bernie's work was really influential in making me think about that question more deeply from a scientific as well as musical perspective. Now I understand he's also a musician. I haven't heard a lot of his music before, but I really liked how he explained the ways that sound could tell a story over time. Mm. And I think this gets into answering your second question, because when he in his uh, really great TED talk shows, um, I think it's in the Sierra Nevada mountains actually in upstate California, he has a, um, a comparison of two sonograms from before and after selective logging practices. Mm. And you can see all the sounds fitting together like puzzle pieces in the first one, mm -hmm. and it's really rich and everything's dancing all over the screen. And then after selective logging, supposedly a non-harmful procedure is exacted on this environment, you see the sonogram after, and all of these sounds are missing. They're gone. And I think having the visual reinforcement is really useful scientifically, especially because mm -hmm. when you listen to music, for eight hours a day like I do sometimes. Your ears can start to fool you, but the sonograms never lie. So um, That's fascinating. I had no idea people use sonograms with music. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many of us do, but I certainly do. You do. Um, and when I go in to analyze my samples and to find moments, musical moments that jump out at mm -hmm. me from a natural recording, I'll excerpt them and Sometimes, in order to make a single voice more clear, I'll do some EQ and stuff like that, but I always go back to the sonogram to try to preserve what's naturally happening because I don't want to lose the integrity of what I've captured. Because that, that's the story. I'm just the messenger. Right. <laughs> um, so I want to ask you yeah. a question that I heard you say. I believe it was in your TEDx, or it might have been in one of the National Geo articles that I read about you. Um, either you wrote it or I read it about you. I, I can't recall. But you mentioned this idea that you can bring sounds of the wilderness to an urban setting. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way for people who don't get that experience to connect to nature, to connect to the wild through your music. Um, and I'd love to hear you talk more about that. Sure. Um, being in New York City is the prime source of inspiration for that thought process as a composer, as a conservationist, as, as an artist still figuring out exactly how I can shape my craft. Um, it's an exciting and also somewhat amorphous time right. <laughs> um, in my career. Uh, but one of the things I found very quickly was that when I played these bits of music, I started with like backyard birds, mm. you know, New York birds, nothing that seemed too exotic to me. I played it at places like the New York Botanical Garden and people were stunned. They didn't know that these sounds could be heard in their backyard and that really jolted me out of my comfort zone because I knew these bird songs backwards and forwards. I'd been listening to them my entire life. And I didn't think anything of that, but that was one of the things that the audience gave me and taught me as a performer and a creator of this music, is mm. that even the seemingly the most humble and natural and, and normal sounds, the most quotidian bird songs, could be exotic to somebody. And I started to realize, well, New York is this place with so many different creative people working together, but I don't think we tune into nature all that much. Mm. And I've also started to notice that people really crave that in New York City, more than I expected. Mm. Um, my work was sparked by my own desire to reconnect with nature because I was doing a lot of beatboxing, a lot, going to a lot of shows, but not really getting my birding fix. So I used this as a way of kind of coping initially and then shared it and people 
felt the same way. Um, and I'm hoping now that as I expand into new ecosystems and travel abroad and bring the music back to people in New York and, and other cities, um, that music can become a gateway for all of us to engage with the natural world intellectually as well as creatively, because as I mentioned before, the sounds that I'm playing all have a natural origin. All right, it's fascinating. I mean, there's more and more studies showing that even seeing a green setting on a screen mm. changes us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure the same is it's the same with music. Yeah. And 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 the sounds that you are recording and Bernie Cross is recording and other people mm. like that. Uh, that that the, I know it has that impact on me. I'll play Bernie's wild sounds, mm -hmm. for instance, and it's transformative. Yeah. And I think people who live in cities um, can be the majority of the human population now lives in urban settlements, and it seems to me like it's really important for us now more than ever to help those people connect because if we don't tune into nature, then eventually the recordings are going to be all that we have left of a lot of these so species. True. So you see this as a way in, uh, to educate people to take care of nature. Yes, and I think as, as a musician, as an artist, uh, I'm coming to define myself as an artist. <laughs> as an artist. <laughs> um, is there a difference between artist and, and musician? I'm not distinguishing those so much as I am revealing my own um, not not discomfort, but I, I, I'm still figuring out what it means to be an artist because right. I didn't I didn't set out to be one. I, right. I set out to unite two things that I've loved my whole life. It's probably better. It, yeah, you I know, not to be self consciously defining yourself, but letting that happen. Right. But I really want to hear some of sure, this. Sure. Yeah. Of can course. You, can you play a bit for us? Yeah. So um, I've I've sampled some sounds of New York birds on uh, this this thing called an Ableton Push, and I can play them like instruments. Um, and so these are woodpeckers and a wood thrush, and that's a, a bittern. Um, but if you combine them all together, you can create something really exciting. So we have um, the main riff is a morning dove, and then we have me beatboxing, and then that's a, a red winged blackbird. And we have Northern Cardinal. And um, let's change it up. That's a Blue Jay driving the mix now. What's amazing is that... And you recorded these? I have not recorded these, actually. OK. Um, I've started recording more and more because, for me, uh, for me, the process of creating this is always going to be incomplete until I can go in the field myself. I see. But when I got my start about 18 months ago, I had no idea how to record wildlife. Um, so You've just been doing this for 18 months? Yeah. Sounds like the birds of New York City. Astounding. <laughs> it, it, it has a life of its own, and I think that's going back to what you're talking about with, with kind of being an artist and figuring out what that means. It's exciting to have something that has momentum that's bigger than you, right. um, and you've start, sort of stumbled upon it, um, and now you can be the messenger for why it's exciting. Um, so when I started, the, I, I worked a lot with sounds from this set I purchased from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the oh, Macaulay Library, my, wow. my uh, Vatican, my Mecca. My <laughs> um, it's... It's an amazing place, and they have a lot of incredible sounds and an incredible amount of data attached to each one, so you know where each one came from. So I was very fastidious in choosing sounds that were only recorded in New York um, to be able to then say to everybody who listened, go outside after this show and listen, because there's music everywhere you go, and this is what you can hear in your backyard. And they actually sing together. So they actually sing together, together right. birds that really do sing together. And now they're not going to sound exactly like the song well, I've made, but not. I've I've basically been breaking down what is already a perfect musical composition.
thanks to evolution, and rebuilt it into something that is, in a sense, shaped by humans, but still directed by by nature. Right. So, so if you were to say to to to, to kind of encapsulate what your your message is in doing this, and I'm going to put a few words in your mouth, and you sure. can change it. But <laughs> it seems to me that you're really trying to find a way to both locate yourself in place. And that's, a, I'm a writer, I'm an environmental writer. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's a really important, and, and I, I know you're a journalist too, so you understand what I'm saying, right. that, that where we are is really important to know. A lot of my students, I teach environmental writing, environmental mm -hmm. literature. You know, we, we all, we can know about other places in, in, in different time frames, in different locations, but we don't often know about where we are. And that that's a very important piece of, of being an environmentalist, of being someone who's engaged with uh, nature and, and issues about the environment. So there's that. So you're, you're really kind of locating yourself here. And then you're wanting to sort of connect nature that's here to the people here and helping them make that relationship right. so that they feel more deeply invested in this place and to care about it. Yeah. I think that I... I really stand behind a lot of what you said, and I also want to emphasize, at the same time, there are a lot of creative ways to engage with nature. Mine is just one example. Okay. And music is so flexible in that way and so powerful because it permeates every dimension of our culture as human beings. And I think in many ways, people can easily argue that it's attributable to natural sources of inspiration if you go way back in time, uh, <laughs> as, well, there's lots as of Bernie has written in his books. Right, and there's yeah. theories about singing that come from, comes from birdsong, right? right exactly. That human voice and human speaking and human singing. Right, and human having music. overlaps right. in the same hearing range, and obviously that's not coincidence. Somehow it has to be mm -hmm. a beautiful orchestration of evolution and scientific relationships. And at the same time, I I've met plenty of really brilliant visual artists, lots of amazing writers, um, and being a writer myself, I really appreciate that um, and hope to return to that in some way as well. Music is just one way to tune into nature again and reconnect, and I think that the more you explore yourself as an artist, as a creator, as somebody who's building a bridge that solves this problem we all have of reconnecting to nature more and more now, you'll find that you can contribute your, your own voice to the mix, and in some ways, be driven both by a cause that chooses you, but also just by the celebratory nature of the work you're making. Absolutely, and it's very it's very joyous. I feel right. <laughs> I feel happy in your presence, you know, and I, I it, it sort of passes along. Yeah, this likewise. Set, and, I, and I didn't know. I looked at these machines and I thought, well, why? You know, what's he going to do with those? But I, right. I I see now, and that's really an interesting piece too. Is that hybridity? You have animals, right. <laughs> you have machines and computers and music, mm -hmm. human. Um, and there's also, the, my students often remind me, we, we are of nature too. We are not you know, something else, right? right? So I think you're reminding of this, this, yeah. uh, this too, you know, reminding us of this. So that's really exciting. Yeah. Well, I really wish you luck, Thank you, um, and I'm excited to see where your career goes. It seems like it could go many directions. We were talking about musicals and <laughs> we earlier, were, yes. and you know <laughs> that sort of thing. But I want to thank you for coming. Thank you for having and, me. And um, your this is Ben Mirren. And his work is available online. You can look for it all over the place. You had this year you spent with National Geo, so there's articles on that and material. That he's got a TEDx. And um, we're just so thrilled to have you. And it's such a wonderful connection you're making with the birds, with nature, with music, and people. And I'm sure it's great for children. <laughs>
to Madagascar to record lemur sounds. That's right. Not just lemurs, but all the endemic species I can find in four different rainforests around the island. I'm trying to document that threatened ecosystem and hopefully create a standing work of music with local artists and definitely with local biologists to pay tribute to what's out there. That's fantastic. Well, we'll be looking for your work and so excited. Thank Good you, Heidi. Good luck in Madagascar. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> 